Yes, so I'll start again once again. Um, thank you everybody for attending this training session. My name is Judith Owiga and I work for UN Habitat and together with a consortium of organizations that you can see at the bottom of the screen, we are running this uh, regional training program for Africa and the topic is key aspects towards advancement of e-mobility in the region. I'll just give you um, a short overview of the Solutions Plus project. Uh, under which this uh, training is being undertaken. So this training is being done today and tomorrow on 17th and 18th October. And it's, it's really under the Solutions Plus project, which is the Solutions Plus project aims to set up a global platform for shared public and commercial e-mobility solutions to kickstart the transition towards e-mobility, uh, low carbon urban mobility. Um, something else I should add is we do have interpretation um, during this session. So if you'd like to hear our French interpreters, kindly go to the bottom of your screen and uh, you can actually go to the French channel. So um, just to repeat that, Solutions Plus project is mainly focused on the setting up of a global platform for shared public commercial e-mobility solutions. Um, so we are currently working in 10 cities all over the world, uh, Quito, Montevideo, Hamburg, Madrid, Kigali, Dar es Salaam, Kathmandu, Hanoi, Pasig, and Nanjing. So in this, within these cities, we have been carrying out some demonstration projects. Uh, we've been carrying out some demonstration projects. Um, in this training, we are carrying it out together with um, the Jeff project, which is being run by UNEP. So we actually do have participation from some West African cities, some participants from West African cities um, who are part of the Jeff project. Um, so some of the things that the Solutions Plus project looks at is different business models and associated tools. We're looking at different types of vehicles, different types of operations and different types of integration. As you can see, that has been mentioned on the screen over here. Uh, for the purpose of this training program, we are mainly for, for this training program today and tomorrow. And for the one in November, we are mainly focusing on electric two and three wheelers. Um, I just wanted to give you an overview of the Solutions Plus project. It's mainly, we mainly have uh, six main work packages. The first one is mainly focused around the toolbox and evaluation. The second one is capacity building, which is where this training program is focused on. The third one is on market solutions and business models. Then we have demonstration and pilot projects. Then we have scale up, finance, bankability, and policy environment. We also have exploitation and dissemination, and we also have uh, a work package focusing on the management of the whole project. Um, a little bit about some of the other training programs that we have that are targeted towards a global audience. Uh, we've had, uh, these are some of the e-courses that we have been running. The first one was on electric mob mobility more than just electrifying cars. Uh, it mainly was introducing different participants to electric mobility, charging infrastructure, and then ECOS 2 was on ease on the electrification of buses and its integration in cities, public transport system. We have just concluded on this one. Much later in the year, we're going to be doing another course on mass and ITS. And then next year, we're going to be looking at a course on electrification and paratransit. And then um, just to give you an overview of today's program, uh, like I mentioned, um, so this program is going to take two hours. Uh, we're going to start with a recap of the 2021 regional training, which we carried out last year, which was mainly focused on charging infrastructure. Then we're going to have a video on introduction to battery types. Then we're going to have a presentation of a policy paper uh, on managing electric safety in LEVs by CRF. And then we're going to, this is where we're going to have the Q&A session. So during the presentations, I encourage you to post your questions in the chat. And then after that, we're going to go into the next session where we're going to have a presentation on battery swapping regulations being presented by UNEP. And then we're going to have a, a presentation from Total talking about their partnership with Ampersand when it comes to battery swapping. And then we're going to have a Q&A, our second Q&A session. 
Then in the last session, we're going to have a panel discussion on standards where we have a panel with different regulatory authorities and it will be moderated by UNEP and then we shall have the conclusion. So this is the program for today. Um, this is the program for tomorrow, just to give you an overview. Uh, we're going to have a presentation on battery management software. Then we're going to have a presentation on market-oriented battery options. Then we're going to have a case study on case uh, battery and fleet management. We're going to have um, a topic on asset finance and financing batteries. We're going to have a topic on mass, mass ecosystem, digitalization, and finally, uh, a panel with different startups talking about battery asset management. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and then after the training program, we're going to send you some a follow-up email for feedback and m and &E on how to, what topics we can focus on and how we can improve. Um, so that's going to be, that's mainly the overview of um, the training program so that you can understand what we're going to do. Once again, I just want to repeat that this session is actually being recorded. So, and we shall post it on YouTube. And secondly, there is interpretation for French. If you're a French speaker, you can go to the bottom of your screen and get French interpretation. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker and that's going to be Edwin and Ray Han from FIA. Yes, hi Judith, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Great, I will share my screen because I will give uh, a sub overview of what was the charging infrastructure training of last year, which was uh, roughly a year ago. And there we had different uh, days of trainings on charging infrastructure. And I will try to do it in 10 minutes because this week and these two days are on batteries, of course, but uh, charging infrastructure was module three, that was a year ago. And I want to show to you uh, this agenda. So first I will explain a little bit what we discussed last year on the importance of EV charging infrastructure, then um, about charging typologies, the standards, and I also saw that this week, of course, standardization is important in battery oil uh, things, but also it is very important on the charging infrastructure side. Uh, so the standards and interoperability, a little bit on city planning, which was also an important topic last year. And uh, yeah, then I hope to, to close off uh, with, uh, yeah, within the 10 minutes. So first, why is EV recharging infrastructure so important? Yeah, of course, battery swapping is uh, is uh, very important, but also swap batteries need to be charged. And I think uh, it's also what we discussed last year that to get the, beep, the vehicle moving, what kind of vehicle it is, and if you want to have it an electric vehicle, you really need to be uh, active in recharging infrastructure and also in a satisfactory way uh, for the users. So it is very important to focus on recharging infrastructure in all kinds of uh, modalities. Uh, so because uh, the charger, the charger itself is a sort of in between the vehicle and the user, and you have to be uh, available. So make them available for the user. Of course, it's very important to think about what kind of power do you need? How fast do you want to charge that vehicle? Uh, a, a very heavy vehicle must be uh, charged faster than a, 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 a smaller vehicle because the big battery which is in there and you don't want to wait for hours uh, or maybe some days if your charging speed is too slow. So that was also what we discussed a lot about last year. Reliability, it must work. Uh, if you are on the road and you rely on a charger and it doesn't work, it is a very big, uh, big problem because then you cannot continue your drive. You cannot continue your, uh, your ride. So it's really important that charging infrastructure is reliable and that it works all the time. And of course, it must be user friendly. And uh, user friendliness is not only that you can click your, uh, your plug into a socket but also that you can start the session easily. And in public charges in Europe, uh, that is not always very uh, uh, easy. In the beginning, we had some lessons learned that interoperability between the charger and the vehicle, and also between the charger and, for example, 
a bank card or a paying card to, to start charging your vehicle and public uh, charging infrastructure is not always very user friendly. So user friendliness was a very important topic also in, uh, in last year's uh, training. And if you have these four elements uh, good, so sufficiently available, good power, the right power for your vehicle, it works all the time and it is user friendly, then you can set up an, a good and sustainable business case on charging infrastructure. So the importance are these four elements. This one is uh, some more details on those four elements. Uh, so if you look at sufficient and also user friendliness, payment must be good. Uh, it must be seamless. So, uh, so it's easy to, to start. And uh, even also uh, maybe in the in private premises, but of course also in public. If you go, for example, to a charging station uh, uh, with facilities, also those facilities must be good. Uh, safe, uh, also with lighting, for example, hygienic, if you also have toilets there, and maybe some uh, leisure services and availability of food and drinks if you have to wait for your charging session. So these, these elements are important to think about when you start with charging infrastructure. Then we saw also that all in the, the different models of, uh, of vehicles like buses, uh, trucks, passenger cars, and also uh, light electric vehicles like the two and the three wheelers, you can have different charging typologies, different patterns of charging. Of course, a lot of people charge at home. Uh, when they start the day, their vehicle is full. But when you're on the road, it's also more and more that you see that there are so uh, uh, charging stations on the highways, uh, around the highways, which are fast charging stations where you wait for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then you can continue your drive. We call that with the passenger cars, transit rapid charging. And also with lighter vehicles, so you see more and more options that yeah, maybe battery swapping is a very good uh, option for lighter vehicles but also uh, to charge uh, uh, with a short stop, drink a coffee, have a lunch, and then you continue. But we see also a lot of options, uh, overnight charging at, uh, at hotels, uh, recreational parks, for example. And we see options where uh, it is a combination of shopping and charging. Uh, so like in parking stations, uh, in, the, in shopping areas uh, or shopping malls, uh, which is an important aspect to charge your vehicle there. So based on these charging typologies, you can also see, okay, what is the business model that could fit in my activities on charging? Then, of course, you have to, to stick to standards. Uh, it's also similar to the batteries and the charging infrastructure. You see that on the plugs, uh, there are already many uh, standards uh, in the world uh, uh, available. So for example, in Europe, we have for the AC, we have the Medicus type two. And for the DC, we have the CCS2, which are the two standards that, uh, yeah, that is uh, built up uh, in all the uh, public charging infrastructure in Europe. And still we have also in Europe the Shademo, which is the Japanese uh, standard on DC charging. So you see in Europe, for example, still that we have on the DC chargers two plugs available, Shademo and CCS2. But what we also see is that in North America, there are some different standards. Uh, the CCS DC is related to the one in Europe, but a little bit different. And you see that China has its own standards. And of course, what I mentioned already, Japan. And down on the bottom, we also discussed a little bit on uh, all kinds of other uh, charging infrastructure possibilities. So not with a plug, but, but for example, with a pantograph or with an, uh, even an electric road where you, where you drive uh, while you charge. Also there, it is very important to think about standardization. So that when you drive, for example, on the highway, like shown here on the right side, that when you go to another country or another region, that the standard of that highway and the charging of that highway is similar than the one in your own country. So standardization is really important. And that's also what we discussed last year. Then you see uh, it's not very easy to set up standards because it's a very complicated world already in the EV charging uh, standardization world. Uh, you have the energy side, you have the infrastructure side itself, you have the vehicle side and you have the services. And all that needs to be connected uh, with protocols, with procedures that, and also with communication around it. Here you see some uh, 
big organizations in Europe which are involved and in Africa you can also set up a structure like this with the right names and not only the examples but the right and the the, the organizations who are involved lessons learned in Europe and that needs to be uh, I think uh, avoided in the front in Africa for example we saw that from the beginning onwards more and more apps were used to even uh, find the charging stations and also for the payments uh, so, for example, on the left, you see how many uh, apps you needed to travel through Europe. And uh, because there are a lot of EMSPs who are having those charging cards and also connected to, to apps, we say uh, don't go to this fragmentation, but try to be as stable as, as possible to start with the protocol up front and to avoid all those different cards. And to do that, uh, for example, you can use the OCPI and the OCPP protocols, uh, which are now standard in Europe, and uh, which provide this, this uh, connection between the CPOs and the charging station itself and with uh, the vehicle users. And that is also the, uh, the, the important thing of interoperability. That is, uh, yeah, it, it sounds very uh, complicated, but the thing is that interoperability says that you need to be connected to everything uh, and it needs to be easy. So it needs to be functional, it needs to be safe, it needs to be compatible with all the equipment and the protocols, reliable, it must work all the time and it must be available. Then something uh, which was very interesting for also the cities itself, because uh, you can see from the uh, infrastructure side that you want to have a business case, you have to really work together. So it's not uh, the private, it's not the public, but it is all in total, you have to build up your charging infrastructure together. So in the city of Maastricht, for example, we did this, the city uh, with the business uh, itself, and we set up a strategic uh, plan, a strategic map for the city of Maastricht. And based on that, we said, okay, these are the highlights within the city where we want to build up the charging infrastructure. These are the stakeholders where, which are involved. And already up front, we saw some demand from organizations where there was no charging infrastructure yet when we started this process. And that is, for example, the yellow dots here, in, which was mainly in the city center where there was no charging infrastructure uh, in the beginning. So based on that, we st started to think about and then roll out the charging infrastructure altogether. And important that, uh, and that's also what's uh, really important in Africa, is you cannot do that without a utility company, because you also need to know where are the strengths and the weaknesses of our own electricity network. Uh, you can start building up charging infrastructure, but when it's too far from the main connections, for example, it costs you a lot of uh, time to, uh, to make it uh, available and possible, but also a lot of money. So you can do that also with uh, setting up some smart combinations. So using for ex uh, existing, uh, for example, electricity from Metro, Train and Subway. Uh, and you can also think about prevent grids from overloading at peak hours to make it a smart charging infrastructure. So that in the peaks you avoid a lot of charging, but in the, in the downtime you do the charging with the vehicles. So if you work together with the utility company, you also have the data around that. And that's also what we did, uh, for example, not only with passenger cars, but all modalities uh, to make smart combinations, for example, in charging hubs. And that's also what we explained last year. Then monitoring is important. Uh, this is on a city level. So you start planning your charging infrastructure try to also start measuring from the first day onwards. So then you know what happens in your city. And you see then the growth of number of used charging points on a yearly or a monthly or an hourly basis. And you can also see how many unique users you already have from the beginning onwards. This is the example of the city of Amsterdam, but there are many occasions where it is important to start measuring when you start setting up the charging infrastructure. That was it. I hope I uh, did it in the almost 10 minutes. If you have questions, I will be available in this first hour, but uh, I will also, of course, uh, think that you have a lot of questions on the batteries. But if you even have a question on charging infrastructure, I will be available. Thank you, Judith. Back to you. I will stop sharing my screen.
Uh, thank you very much, Edwin, for that very interesting presentation. Um, like Edwin mentioned, um, if you have any questions, kindly put them in the chat and then we shall address them uh, when we have the 10 minute Q&A session. Um, just to remind everybody, uh, we do have a French translation. Should you be interested in um, some French, should you be a French speaker? Right now, we are going to go into a presentation by Idiada on the different battery types. So I'll just go ahead and play this video. Welcome to the Solution Plus Battery Training Course. I'm Mikael Ponens, the Battery Systems Team at Idiada, and today I will talk about batteries for electric vehicles. Specifically, this presentation will focus on the type of the batteries that they are, the technologies and the materials to end up with the safety and validation standards. So first, let's look at the type of the technologies that are out there. This is a brief description of a battery, a schematic. It's an electrochemical storage device, where the electrical energy is stored in form of chemical energy at the anode and the cathode. During discharging, lithium ions flow from the anode to the cathode through the electrolyte, while electrons flow through the external circuit, powering the device of interest. On the other hand, during charging, an external potential is applied and lithium ions and electrons flow the other way around, from the cathode to the anode. There are four main components of a battery. The cathode, which is usually a mixed metal oxide, ultimately defines a lot of the properties of the battery, such as range, durability, and performance. The anode, currently graphite, also they are moving towards uh, silicon composites nowadays. And there is the electrolyte, which is the lithium ion carrier. It's currently a liquid with a mixture of lithium hexafluorophosphate in organic carbonates. And finally, the separator, a membrane allowing lithium ions to pass but blocking the electrons. This figure shows a broad roadmap from the batteries in general. Before lithium ion batteries appeared in the 80s, the market was dominated by lead acid, nickel cadmium, and nickel metal hydride. Those were very low energy densities, good enough for consumer electronics, but not suitable for electric vehicles. Once lithium ion technologies were discovered, the amount of energy of batteries per either mass or volume increased drastically, which means they could be used in mobility applications. There are several technologies out there, which will be presented in the next slide. That makes lithium ion batteries a big family and very application dependent. And finally, research is moving towards a next generation of lithium batteries, for example, lithium sulfur and lithium air batteries, which will show extremely high energy densities and capacities. Those technologies are still in the research phase and not, are not expected to be commercially available in the near future. There is some also trends in trying to remove the liquid electrolyte and replacing for a solid state. This will reduce the total volume and therefore increment the volumetric energy density of the current lithium ion batteries. Those spider charts are the graphical illustration of how versatile is the lithium ion technology by simply changing the cathode. We could achieve different properties suited for different applications. The properties are specific energy, is the total capacity of the battery. Basically, how far can it travel, also known as the range? How many miles can the battery deliver? This is important, especially for medium and large EVs. Specific power is how this power is delivered, how easy this power is delivered. This is important for city cars and buses, where you are constantly accelerating and braking, and not so much for driving long distance. Cost is another important property, include the raw material and the processability of the battery. Very important for mass production, but less important from top of the range cars, like should be a Ferrari. Lifespan is the durability of our cycling to reach the state of health of 80%. Performance is how the battery performs at low and high temperatures, for example. This is very important uh, when cars are sold in extreme climate areas or non-conventional or non locations. 
And finally, safety metric is how thermically stable it is and the chance of not getting a thermal runaway event. This is an intrinsic property of the material, but fatal events like accidents, fire, will be mitigated with the right engineering modifications at model at battery pack level. So even an LFP is considered safer than an NMC type at vehicle level. If the correct engineering measures have been put in place, the battery will be as safe as the other. As a rule of thumb, the higher the nickel content, the higher the energy or the higher the range the battery is, but it lowers their stability. Finally, I just want to point out that LTO, lithium titanate oxide, is not a cathode itself, but an anode that will, be, will replace graphite, hence it is highlighted in green. Not only the materials used will determine the battery properties and performance. The cell formats have also an impact. There are three main cell formats, which are cylindrical cells, such as the ones found on Tesla Model 3. They have a very low manufacturing cost and are well optimized. As cons, they are inefficient at packing. Pouch cells, such as those found on the Nissan Leaf, they give a lot of flexibility of the design. On the other hand, they have poor mechanical strength. Finally, prismatic cells, such as the ones found in BMW i3, they are simpler, with good mechanical strength and have a good packing. But on the other hand, they have very poor flexibility in design. They are very rigid. So, having reviewed those technologies, let's find out what a battery is suitable for different applications. In this case, the electric vehicle. Here is a short summary of the preferred application for each battery type, depending on the vehicle use and size. Know that this is just generalization, meaning each application must be, must be looked carefully into. Microhybrids, usually driven in the cities and not doing many miles, tend to prefer cheaper and high power solutions, such as LFP. As the powertrain is getting more and more electrified, from hybrids to BHEV, both high power and high energy solutions are used, depending on the preference of the OEM. Pure electric vehicles, especially medium and large sector, they tend to prefer high energy solutions, such as NMC, due to the highly yearly mileage rate those vehicles are expected to have. That means you can drive as much, more, much more miles per single charge. However, when it went to public transport sector, especially in buses, a relatively safer or, thermic or more thermically stable solution is preferred, such as LFP again. In addition, due to the amount of raw materials needed per vehicle, costs are also important metric to consider for buses. Now, we will look closer to the safety aspects of the battery. For an average vehicle driver and passenger, the general public, the main risks of batteries are fires that can happen suddenly. This is an example of a Tesla Model S in China that started emitting a white smoke and on fire shortly after. This is an example of thermal runaway of a cell and subsequent propagation. This phenomenon could happen due to an active abuse, such as a shock, or due to a cell deterioration that suddenly breaks out. So let's review the possible source of abuses that can happen. The first type of abuse is mechanical abuse. This means inserting an object, such as a nail, or impacts, like crushing. This leads to a deformation and separate, separate or breaking, and ultimately internal short circuits. Then there is the electrical abuse, such as an overcharge, or over discharge. This leads to dendrite growth and piercing separator, which leads to, again to internal short circuits. Finally, there is the thermal abuse, such as overheating the battery. This means exposing the battery to extreme high temperatures, which might result in separator melting and ultimately internal short circuits. 
Those internal short circuits will lead to thermal runaway, an exothermic reaction, generating toxic smoke, fire, or explosions. This thermal runaway, as it generates heat, could propagate to neighborhood cells, leading to more smoke, heat, and fire, and the complete destruction of the battery pack. This is what happened in the previous slide with the Tesla Model S in China. So to ensure that those safety hazards are well managed, several safety standards or protocols have been developed around the world. As you can see in this map, safety standards vary widely across the globe. For example, in North America use SIE and SAN standards, including the J2464, J2929, and the SAN 2017-6925. Europe, in the other hand, is regulated by the UN ECE R100, currently on amendment number three, which came into force uh, early this year, while China has the GB38031 that came into force in 2020 as the main standard for testing batteries. Other countries have their own regulation, but they follow more or less the R100. This is the case of India, for example, where AIS 38 and 48 is analogous to the R100 in Europe. A list of mechanical safety tests for each regulation are shown in this slide. Vibration tests, mechanical shock, and mechanical integrity are the most common adapted safety protocols to test on batteries. For vibration, the battery is placed in a shaker and different vibration profiles are applied. For mechanical shock, the battery is launched at speeds against a wall or simulating a collision. It's also called a dynamic shock. For mechanical integrity, the battery is squeezed at a given force. It is also known as the static shock. The battery is considered safe to pass if there is no fire, explosion, or loss of isolation after those tests. A list of thermal safety tests for each regulation are shown in this slide. Thermal shock and cycling Fire resistance and over temperature are the most commonly adopted for the regulators around the world. Thermoshock introduced to the battery to extreme heat and cold in short period of time. Usually, temperature range will be as low as minus 40 degrees to plus 60 degrees, cycled over a period of days, with a maximum of 30 minutes between each extreme temperature. Fire resistance consists in testing the battery open fire exposure and check if it is stable for a period of time. Mm. This is almost certainly applicable for yeah, all yeah, batteries yeah, the, yeah. where the battery is located under the driver or passenger yeah, yeah, yeah. but not when the battery is located in the roof, such as the case of electric buses. Over temperature, try to ensure that the battery is safe when tested above a maximum operating temperature while cycling. It is worth to point out that thermal propagation tests where a thermal runaway event is induced, are considered more and more by legislators. And despite it's only required in China nowadays, it will be required in Europe and deployed elsewhere. There is a trend in the regulation bodies to include those tests to ensure driver and passengers are safe in event of total battery failure. A list of electrical safety tests for each regulation are shown in this slide. Short circuit, overcharge, overdischarge, and overcurrent are the most commonly adopted tests to ensure the battery is electrically safe. Short circuit ensures no fatal failure is reached if the in event of touching positive and negative terminals externally. Usually, fuses are used as a protective measurement. Overcharge, overdischarge, and overcurrent tests are performed to ensure that the battery is safe even when put it outside its working voltage and current operational windows. Usually, the BMS is the protective measure, which open contactors when unsafe conditions are met. And finally, there is a list of environmental safety tests. In this case, it is China regulation that requires 
most of the environmental tests, such as water measure, salt spray, or altitude test. So, uh, the, thank you very much. Uh, come on. Yes, we have come to the end of that presentation, even though it just ended abruptly. Um, so, like I mentioned, if you have any questions, kindly type them into the chat, then we shall pick them up and we shall ask them in the Q&A session. Um, if you're a French speaker, we do have French translation, so you can go, it, go and look at it at the bottom of the screen and just kindly note that we actually have, um, we are recording the session. At this point, I would like to hand over to Vittorio from CRF to do his presentation. Good morning, to, good afternoon to everybody. Also my side, let me quickly share my screen. Yes. And just back over. Okay. Are you able to see my screen or not? Right now I see a black screen. Oh, that's not good. Yes. Um, is it full screen or not for you? It was not for, it just came for a moment and then now it's a black screen. <laughs> yes. That's interesting. A few seconds ago it was working. Yeah. Let me try to do it again. Now it seems my piece is blocked too. It's totally blocked. I don't understand what is happening. Maybe just it's it's blocking the share. It's totally blocked the screen. I'm not able to do anything. Only the audios work. Okay. Uh, alternatively, I could share from the slides that I have. Yeah, but I need any way to see you. Oh, <laughs> it's just not easy to. Let's just give it some time. Um, as we wait for Vittorio to set up, I would just like to check whether Nu Wong is on the call. Uh, yes, I'm in the call. Yes. Um, yes, I, I, you have my slide, right? And yes. you share it from your uh, end. Okay, thank you. So maybe I'm thinking you want, maybe we can go and have your presentation first and then we can come back to Victoria. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm still driving, so if you want to, it's fine. Okay, cool. So maybe we just wait for Victoria to see if he can, if he's back on the call. He's not yet back. Just give him a few minutes.
I am back. Okay. I hope you can see me. Let's try again. Yeah, just share your screen. Yes. Yes, we can see your screen. Let me reopen the file. Yes, we can see. Okay. Now is it okay? Okay, so you can go ahead. Good. Sorry for the problem. Obviously, this is Windows. I was saying good morning, good afternoon from my side. I will try at this point more quickly to give you an overview of what is becoming a, a policy paper. So you will have a full paper describing all what I'm going to shortly show you. And I will start to speak to you about the main electrical safety issue we can have in electric vehicle. One is the so-called ARC. Electrical arc is defined as the fact that if I try to open a circuit with current flow in flu, I can have ejected clouds of molten and burning metals, and this can take place independently from the voltage level. The second possible problem is the well-known electrical shock. Welcome to Jesus Music World. The Bluetooth device is ready to pair. Hello? No, go ahead. Are you hearing me? Go ahead, I just muted that. Okay. okay, and the second is the so-called electric shock in which I can have a dangerous current flowing in the body in case I go in contact with a certain voltage. In this case, the voltage level can make the difference, meaning that depending on the voltage level, the current flowing in the body can be or not dangerous. In the first case, arc, these are the possible effects taking place in case an arc occurs, and I am close to that. As you can see, the level of problem is increasing and the final one is very dangerous. The same is for the case of current flowing in the body, so the shock effect. There are also multiple problems also at the earth level in this case. And in this case, on the contrary, as I said before, uh, the matter is how much current is flowing. And the current depends, for a given voltage, on the uh, resistance that the body uh, apply to this voltage pass. So that, as you can see by these simple schemes, uh, depends from the pathway of the current in the body. In this example, through the arms, in this case, arms and one leg and so on. So depending on the pathway, the resistance of the body is different. And so the amount of current for the same voltage is different too. To try to protect, uh, uh, the, in this case, the user of the vehicle at all the level from the manufacturing phase up to the maintenance and the usage and the service too, has been defined in different voltage classes. And in particular, in automotive, we have identified this big difference that is the so-called uh, threshold between A and B class, meaning that all what is under 60 volt DC, this is the battery voltage in our case, can be considered from this perspective not dangerous. I can touch the living voltage with no negative effect on me, while voltage higher than that create problems that has to be managed avoiding this contact. Uh, be aware on a point, uh, this voltage level defined in automotive business 60 is not the same used in industrial application. In industrial application, it is considered a value of 120, so two times more, and that is due to the fact that in this domain, so the industrial, what is expected is that the voltage is taking place in a working environment under control, Humidity temperature is in a fixed place, possibly not an open space, an open, uh, let me say, area. And second, who is facing this voltage in uh, working activity is a typically skilled, trained uh, expert operator with proper uh, so-called personal protection equipment that can be proper gloves, uh, shoes, uh, helmet, uh, and so on. In the case of automotive, or what are considered the cars, light duties, typically cars and vans, heavy duties, trucks and buses, we have decided to use a value one half for multiple reasons. The first is that the environment cannot be controlled as it is the industrial one. Cars, vehicles are everywhere, and where they are, that could be water, mud, and other effects that can obviously reduce the uh, insulation, electrical insulation of the system. The second is that the operator are drivers that in general are not the professional expert uh, operators of an industrial plant. Uh, and in general, they have 
uh, not using the so-called personal protection equipment. We are used to have standard dresses uh, and a lot of time metallic objects like uh, watch, rings, uh, bracelet, chains that obviously for the current perspective can be very dangerous. And finally, uh, in case of crash, uh, so the, let me say worst condition, if the vehicle is highly damaged and doing that the person inside is injured too, with earth to metallic parts or his, his personal body. Internal resistance can be largely reduced. And keep in mind that one half of our resistance is due to the skin. So if I have cuts on my skin, immediately the value given before become one half and due to that, the same voltage produced two times the current that can be dangerous. Here the ratio to, that we decided to apply in this direction. Uh, the further problem already well explained by the colleagues, but the, before me already give you a presentation, for instance, the very interesting the other one on the technical aspect of the battery is that battery is not a tank. In general, people believe that a battery is the equivalent in electric vehicle of a tank. It can be from the functional perspective, but undoubtedly not from the behavior itself. Tank is, let me say, at the end, uh, like a, a classical glass in which I can put a liquid today, my fuel, diesel, gas, and what it is. And so refueling, for instance, is simply the transfer of this liquid from one bigger tank, the station one, to the smaller in the car. In the case of electricity, as said by Idiada very clearly, we are on the contrary making happen chemical reaction. Charging, discharging are at the end mechanism in which the current flow, that is the one allowing, for instance, the propulsion of the vehicle, is due to a chemical sequence of reaction, the so-called uh, reduction oxidation reaction. And this reaction have a specific dynamics, efficiency, aging effect, are temperature dependent, and so on. In particular, for instance, if you go to see the condition of the so-called battery empty, so the zero state of charge condition, while in the case of a tank, a zero fuel tank is an empty piece of metal or plastic, depending on the material of the tank, in this case, it's not the same. Also, battery defined at a zero state of charge it can be placed, due to the fact that there is any way energy inside, can be a place in which all the abuse tests presented before by the other colleague can create also the zero state of charge, negative effect, dangerous effect as emission of toxic gases, fires, and in the worst case also explosion. Uh, it's been already explained in detail, at least at the level of a few minutes we have for us, which are the possible negative effect. Here is mentioned again the so-called overcharge, Overcharge means, uh, look at this line, that the voltage applied to the battery is higher than the maximum planned, or the equivalent phenomena during discharge, you see on this line, that is the so-called over-discharge. In both cases, uh, if I overcome this limit fixed by the maker of the cell, I can have problem whose final effect is a lot of the time uh, related to thermal runway. So as we've seen, thermal runway, if not protected by the system, can mean let me say the mechanism of creating fires, larger fires, and in the worst case also explosion. The same is for the short circuit. As we have seen, short, short, short circuit can take place outside or inside the battery, depending on the mechanism. Can be also internal short circuit due to mechanical vibration, uh, penetration of materials in case of crash and so on. And here, these are the phenomena. You see here in the lab what you've seen in the Tesla car. These white smokes uh, are due to the fact that the chemical process emit these gases and the system with venting valve try to put them out before the, the system explode. Uh, and second, the fire, in case this process is not taken under control by the external system, at the end, fire tank in place uh, with all the effect that we have seen. Uh, at this point, to address safety as better as possible in the so-called passenger cars and trucks buses, so the field in which this slide I'm going to show you is referred, in general, the problem comes from the fact that today we are pushing more and more this power. We are pushing the, the power because these vehicles are not light, and we are pushing the power because we want uh, higher level performance increase more and more the power means at the end of the story, increase the voltage too. 
because the current is constrained by the limit of limit, physical limits of the cable size and so on. If at this point I increase so much the voltage, what happens is that today in the cars and trucks, all near all the application have to be designed in voltage class B, so more than 60 volt. And so to guarantee protection versus the shock, both mechanical protection shielding and electrical insulation of the voltage circuit procedure has to be applied. It means complexity, vehicle has to be designed with a lot of techniques that means weight, cost, and also, let me say, ability to do the proper control, the proper management, and so on, in order to decouple the two parts, to decouple as much as possible this orange part, that is the high voltage, the one to be fully insulated, from the classical 12 volt part of the car in which there are the typical lamps, fangs of our today cars. To do that, this second part has to be electrically insulated, we said, shielded and decoupled. And the decoupling is reached through this unit that avoid that this uh, system and this system has continuity, electrical continuity each other. There is only magnetic coupling among the two. Without entering the detail of that, clearly, if I can avoid this, the system can become lar largely simpler. And in this direction, the light electric vehicle can be really the vehicle in which this choice can be done because in this type of vehicle, this uh, um, smaller vehicle, being the power level lower, intrinsically lower because the vehicle is smaller and the performance is better too, I can stay in the vo voltage A-class domain. Keep in mind that today, particularly in the four-wheelers, is common to have solutions that are considered low voltage, but anyway, not in a class. That are the one coming from the industrial field mentioned before, in which in a, let me say, simple carryover of the components of a forklift, we have on board a vehicle of 70, 80, 100 volt. That anyway, as I showed you before, can be dangerous. So this is something that is better to be avoided as much as possible. If I can stay in a class, so under 60, I do not need electrical insulation. I don't need complexity like insulation of the part, DC, DC, galvanic insulated, and also the shielding is not needed. And so the system becomes largely simpler. If I go to the previous picture, it means that also the AC part, the so-called propulsion is low voltage under 60. And due to that, if I like, I can also avoid one of these two cables and simplify the circuit. I do not need to shield all this part and I do not need to create a higher cost galvanic insulation inside this DC-DC coupling, the traditional load through the propulsion one. Also in terms of charging, that is the last part of my presentation, there are advantages in the sense that if I follow the car's automotive mindset, we are going towards a never ending increase of energy and power. We want to increase energy to make higher range as said in the previous presentation, but higher energy and shorter charging time because what we have in mind is the typical refueling of a car. So a few minutes means bigger and bigger power because power and luckily is the ratio of energy and time. So higher is the energy, lower is the time for two reasons, my power will grow up. And the effect is under our eyes. We start to develop this increasing high power station where there are the two connectors mentioned before, the CCS2 and the CHAdeMO. In, this is a European layout. We started with 50 kilowatts, then we said 150. Now we are saying 350 kilowatts. And now, as you see in a system under test, someone is already speaking about megawatt. So we are running in the direction to make the system heavier and heavier with cable, oil cooled, and so on, with complexity in the voltage levels and in the safety of increasing value. In the case of the light uh, electric vehicle, the story is totally different. Here you see a light four-wheeler designed, by the way, in the Stellantis Africa the Development Center, so in Morocco, in, in Casablanca, where due to the fact that the vehicle is light, the voltage of the battery is limited, and the range is two because the vehicle has only to go at low speed in town, I can use classical plugs. Before you've seen the type 2, CCS2, all this complexity, I can use, in this case, a classical Shuko. The cable, by the way, is integrated in the vehicle itself, so it's like a vacuum cleaner. You take it out and you connect. You can connect directly to a standard plug, or you can connect if you have a wall box coming from a classical automotive through an adapter. And this 
low voltage is and this low energy are also the right enabler for another very important element that is becoming a key element in the field of light electric vehicle that is the swapping swapping ask for low voltage to handle the battery with no risk and light batteries to make it by hands and in the moped in the scooter the two uh, the electrical bike is already common to have this battery that can be removed mechanically by the user and replace the charges separately out of the vehicle. Totally different for what we are continuing to face in the cars and buses where do the same for the high voltage and the very heavy weight, hundred of kilogram means today a robotization and complexity to guarantee the safety. For instance, for the swappable batteries, there are companies of the level of Piaggio, Honda, KTM, Yamaha that are working to standardize common swappable solution covering two, three, and so on wheeler. The only element to be taken anyway into account is this one. Uh, the voltage are low, the energy is limited, but it does not mean necessarily that also for low power, the current are low because the voltage is very low. We said 40 volt in respect of 400. So also, in a ratio 110 of power, the current are the equivalent to the one of a car. So I can have also in this case, high current, particularly in a case of quick charge at request. And so arc, because arc is voltage independent, but it's more current dependent and thermal management has to be done properly. Low voltage, low energy does not mean no problem, means a part of to be taken properly into account. Just to conclude, Remind me, moving you to the, few, the coming paper that will discuss all these elements more in deep. It will be ready by the end of the year, probably. At some point to be focused by the discussion I did. First is stay in a class, simplify a lot the game. Is a simplification in terms of lower electrical protection that has multiple positive impact, design level, usage, service, and maintenance and also the manufacturing phase. So all the steps of the, of the life of the vehicle will be from this perspective simpler. And in case the not desired case of a crash, also the uh, action of the fire brigades will be simplified by the fact that there is no risk to go in, in contact with high voltage, con let me say, situation, condition. As we said, this voltage is also an enabler for simplify the charging in terms of infrastructure, no need of complexity like we are facing in cars. Uh, and the swap too. And uh, um, at the same time, what I mentioned in the previous slide, be aware that anyway, current, that means arc and thermal management has to be managed, but the large experience of the automotive business can be a good starting point to be considered to do the proper level of safety also for this type of vehicle. Last point, other good side effect to stay under 60 is that automotive has already developed for mild hybrid application a lot of interesting automotive level high volume components motors inverters and so on that can be applied in these smaller two three four wheeler as propelling system not only as a small complement like it is in the case of cars where we speak about hybrids and the second is the batteries the fact that the automotive business is built up more and more higher volume cells can be a good option to find cells to be shared also for lighter vehicle or be using second life. Today, a user's car maker to consider the battery to be replaced on a standard car when it's lost only 20% of its initial energy. And today, the, the typical end means recycling. If we find a way to use part of this pack in other application, as for instance, LDV, um, LDV sorry, can be largely beneficial to make the circular economy more effective. And that's all, sorry again for the technical problem, but at the end, we find a way to go to the end. Thank you again. Um, thank you very much, Vittorio. Um, thank you for the presentation. And also we are really um, glad with the participation that we are seeing in the chat. If you have any questions, kindly put them in the chat and then we shall address them. Um, we'll now head to our next speaker who is Nuong. We will just skip the first Q&A session. Um, what I want to say is the program is pretty packed and I know it's very intense, uh, but because this topic is very interesting and very relevant. 
I will now uh, hand over to Nuwong. Nuwong, would you want me to share my screen or are you in a position to share your screen? Uh, now I can share now. Thank you very much for being with me. So uh, let me let me share from my side. So thank you very much. And also again, you know, um, good, uh, good evening from my side and good afternoon in, from Africa and also maybe good morning to our speak, previous speaker. So my uh, talk today, we will talk about basically the summer initiative that we are working with UNEP regarding of the, the battery swapping uh, regulation. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, here, uh, I will just tell you a little bit more on what we are doing. So basically, I think uh, from the UNEP scheme, right, I think it's, uh, we don't have to emphasize on how much I think the transport has played a role in this air quality and climate change, especially I think uh, when the COP26 last year, where I think many of the country has uh, make a commitment, including Thailand, to be carbon neutrality by the year 2050, and also we're going to be uh, 20 uh, uh, net zero by 2065. And this is just something to highlight the fact that the think transportation also play an um, important, I wouldn't say culprit, but also uh, uh, challenges uh, in the uh, internal decarbonization in this sector. If you look at the left hand side, uh, figure this is basically just the air quality as a global challenge. And I think I circle Bangkok, which is the capital city of Thailand. Here that we actually have also above the average for both PM10 and for PM2.5, which is actually more uh, dangerous in the health issue because we can go to your lungs, those kind of things. And on the right hand side, of course, this is basically the, the climate change that we want to also reduce is, you know, like 60 degrees scenario, 2 degrees scenario, and now we're talking about 1.5 scenario. And of course, I think travel sector I accounted for, I think about the one fourth of the energy related GHG uh, emission, you know, around the world, so in Thailand. So this is uh, why we actually are trying to focus on how to also decarbonize our transportation sector. And this is basically, of course, this is just to highlight that, you know, we are looking at uh, also carry on this uh, global free economy uh, initiative. I think there's uh, a lot of uh, good initiative that uh, by UNEP and many other uh, uh, things and organizations to put on trying to actually uh, improve the vehicle. And also that can be one of the make sure that we can do is also the electric mobility. And of course, this is uh, something that we focus on my project that we have been working with UNEP here. And this is uh, from the UNEP focus, I think the global mobility issue, of course, you know, we are focused in both three segments, you know, the bus, the natural <coughs> electric light duty vehicle, and also the electric two and three wheelers. And the project in particular that I'm with that uh, red box here is actually doing the project uh, for three countries in ASEAN and one in, of course, in Thailand, Philippines, and Vietnam. So this is basically what we are trying to look at the mainstreaming electric mobility of two or three wheelers in Thailand. You know, my talk may be a bit uh, uh, less clinical than previous talk, I can talk about the battery, but this is basically how we can actually use the, uh, the those uh, technical information in place. And this is our uh, primacy in Thailand. So from COP21 to COP26, there's also a lot of the uh, pushing forward for electric mobility in Thailand. So this is something that some number to put like for the national living contribution, we are pledged to reduce about 20 to 25%. Now that is about 130 million. And if you look in transport sector only, that's only 41. And that will be also carbon neutrality by the 2050 again. So with that, I think in the past three years, Thailand has been setting up this uh, National Electric Vehicle Policy Committee. And that's uh, actually spearheaded by the Deputy Prime Minister and currently, he's also the Minister of Energy. And of course, you know, uh, the energy sector are the one that actually driving this, uh, elect, uh, this electric mobility and also the decarbonization issue. And this is basically the from the policy level, then we have set up this like 2025 20, goal, 2030 goal, and 2035 goal that to help in develop the driving the industry towards electric mobility in both, you know, the light duty vehicle, motorbike, or electric two wheelers and as well as a bus and truck. On the left hand side, I'm trying to see in Thai, but I actually see just to translate those are uh, uh, target on the right side in English into the, the near term side that we actually trying to have this uh, 31% uh, 30 of our uh, uh, vehicle production to be electric vehicle by the 2030, that including bus, truck, electric motorcycle, uh, motorcycle as well as also other things. And also on the bottom here is actually to show the also the uh, of course to go in line, in line with the charting infrastructure as well as also many of the measure against the industry. 
And in the past few years also, the electric two wheeler has been quite popular. I think I just show you some of the the uh, highlight here that some project has been you know happening in on the upper left corner. This is some of the university actually near to my office. You know, this is also to help in between campus by using only electric mobility on campus. And on the upper right corner, this is actually our partner, which is the Electric City Generating Authority of Thailand. And they are also spearhead this uh, demonstration uh, unit to try to have all more of the to be electric. So in particular, this unit project, we are working with uh, ECAT in trying to also expand this uh, electric two wheelers in there. On the lower left corner, this is of course the global um, shipping company, DHI Express. They also had um, demonstrated to use this electric two wheeler to deliver the, the product or the parcel to the customer. And last but not least, but I think on the lower right corner here, this is basically a national oil company that actually also trying to ship, also diversify their portfolio from only selling the oil to our now sell and also providing the solution for electric mobility here. Of course, there are many other examples happening, happening around in, in Thailand. So by focusing on, I think the, the one of the uh, achievement in Thailand last year that we have actually launched uh, this, this uh, national standard on electric, uh, remote rechargeable electric energy for system. So this is uh, this is in Thai, I'm sorry, but uh, basically the, there's some English explanation here. The red box is where I'm also serving as a technical committee, also as part of this uh, unit initiative. So we are also trying to at least put some guideline into of uh, how we can frame also the uh, battery for this electric swapping, you know, platform. So if you look on this, some of the information that has been described in this uh, standard that actually are only uh, uh, physical dimension, you know, the the width, length, and height, and also some of the connector as well as the voltage. So I think there are also some of the voltage schemes here showing the 48, um, uh, 72 voltage depending on the brand of each of the electric mobility company that are trying to do it here. So, and also on a, a sec, uh, on a parallel effort. So in our research center, National Energy Technology Center, then we actually having this project that are funded by the national uh, government, government on trying to take that uh, standard and try to, to do some real demonstration with also the free party involving the battery maker, you know, also the service provider for swapping and also the motorcycle uh, company. Of course, in Thailand, I think it's about seventy percent of our motorcycle are still a, a foreign brand, which is a Japanese. But we also have some of the the uh, company in Thailand uh, trying to also do some startup, you know, and also to tap into this value chain of the industry for electric uh, two wheelers. So if you look on the upper left corner here, so we have a, a three group of participation, you know, the battery maker, the beta company here, and we have the the swapping. Uh, our operator, which is ECAT, that we have also the, the show you earlier, and also with Bangja, which is an oil company that has shipped from the, the oil to into the, the so provider for electric mobility, and also the company GPX, which is a Thai brand. So the project scope here, we actually have this uh, platform for battery swapping, and of course, we are work in partnership with the TC, which is uh, also the one that Thailand is here, and is the one that issued this standard I show in this slide. So in this one, we will have you know, the scope is to find out the technical specification, you know, on the platform, battery pack, and also charging station, IoT, and how to also make sure that all those swapping stations are actually connected and also can be checked whether the availability is, is uh, available in there. And also we're gonna have the prototype. So in this, uh, this is the second year now, we start this project last year. So we're gonna have the, but in this year, the demonstration from this uh, regard in this uh, project here. And if you look in the upper lower left corner, this, this is actually uh, the specific, the tentative uh, specification that we passed the public hearing, you know, in Thailand. So we're gonna uh, try to demand this in the prototype to have the battery pack is two in front of parallel. And we have the pack uh, nominal voltage to be mainly 72, but of course we are not forcing everyone to suddenly change to 72 voltage, but we also allow 48 voltage and above. For the minimum pack energy, we are <coughs> trying to at least 
get it to above about 1.5 kilo out per one pack. So the two pack for the electric motorcycle would give the energy is about the three kilowatt hour. And of course, we have this uh, discharge, continuous discharge power to be greater than one kilowatt, you know, for, for each of the pack. And so the maximum <coughs> discharge power to be uh, greater than the 3.75 kilowatt. And this is uh, in response to the demand of the user who actually use this uh, electric motorcycle, you know, from ranging from the taxi driver into the, the also the parcel delivery, you know, the rider. You know. And of course, the way this has been also in, uh, doing some uh, questionnaire that should be preferably less than 9.5 kilograms. So this project will be, of course, uh, carried out with the, some of the route that we are planning and also should be finished by next year. And that could be some of the recommendation that we propose to QC in order to modify or to put more specification in terms of the battery swapping platform in Thailand. Now, on the other, I think, as I mentioned to you, we have this uh, project with uh, UNEP, you know, uh, our partner, and that also with this uh, second phase, we are trying to promote this electric motorcycle uh, as a motorcycle taxi in Thailand. In Thailand, we have the, we have the traffic jam, then this two-wheeler mode is quite popular in terms of the, the taxi as also going to different uh, as narrow street. So back in May, <clears throat> we have this uh, launch, you know, which is also in partnership with TLG, you, know, you look at the upper left corner that uh, we had the MOA agreement, but during that time, I think the, they don't allow the travel outside China. Yes, so we can have the, the online uh, MOA uh, signing ceremony. And the uh, TLG company is actually a global partner uh, with UNEP in terms of the global mobility program anyway. So in this project that we are going to have this 50 unit uh, donation, and also we are going to try to use that you know, in different parts of in the city and trying to uh, do the MRV, you know, the tracking and the measurable, reportable and reportable of, on how those uh, electric mobility can be used instead of the, the motorcycle taxi that running on the gasoline. And then we can quantify those benefits in terms of the greenhouse gas emission and also in terms of the fuel saving for those uh, 50 motorcycles. And so this is uh, the main responsibility. Uh, right at the moment, we are still, I think, yeah, with the global shortage of the logistics for the battery, then they are still affecting this project as well. So we hope to get this project start as soon as possible. So this is the scheme. So we are working with you know many riders, and we have to select them uh, also properly with the other criteria, and then trying to monitor the usage. And this is what we are uh, helping on our side to put in those uh, the DAQ, you know, the acquisition to try to monitor this and also trying to learn about the behavior of the rider in Bangkok and try to quantify the, the mental benefit. And with that, I think this is my end of my presentation. So this is uh, something activity that I can share with you from Thailand that we are working on this electric mobility battery swapping platform. Thank you very much. Back to you. Um, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you for that uh, great presentation. Um, and I'm sure uh, a lot of people have learned a lot and we are also going to um, share more even from the recordings. We're going to share the recordings with different people. So if you want to go more in depth in the presentations, uh, you will have that opportunity. Um, we do understand that the schedule is a little bit packed and it's very intense. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And if we do not address the questions um, on in the Q&A, in our very summarized Q&A, we can also share the answers with you on email. At this point, I would like to in invite one of my colleagues, uh, Jacqueline, to just ask one question that has been posted on the chat. Thanks, Judith. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm going to ask the question to Vittorio. I know he has said he would answer this through email, but maybe just to give an overview, a quick overview of, of an answer to this. And the question is from Etienne saint Tenin Zembo. The question is, could you please share the consequences in brackets, norm safety and hardware of using a system that is greater than 60 volts and greater than 120 volts compared to a system that is less than 60 volts. Yes. Uh, are you, yeah, are you reading me? Yes, I hope so. 
uh, as I wrote in the chat, uh, for the one interested, there will be the, the paper in which some of that will be described. Obviously, it takes a lot of time to give an answer, explaining all the system that are applied or not. Anyway, for the one that need a quick feedback on that, uh, like uh, Etienne, but also I see that uh, not only Etienne is interested, but also she Sheikh is interested, I will directly contact them. There are different impact at different level. And there are different costs to give a general answer. In the term of design, in term of part component you need to introduce uh, in one case and not in the other. Uh, in the system that you have to implement to control in case of need of insulation, that consistency of the insulation in the life of the vehicle. And also when you go to make homologation, for instance, in the case of car Elite, I don't know for the two, three wheelers, honestly, there are different uh, levels to be satisfied in the test to be done for the homologation, depending on these voltage levels. Okay, thank you, Vittorio, for that answer. Um... At that point, at this point, we will now uh, hand over to Total. Um, I need to give the Total speaker uh, administrator rights. Just give me a moment. Oh, Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Um, hello, Dennis. Hi, hi, Judith. Can you now, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Let me make you uh, present here. And then now you can go ahead and present. Okay. Uh, let me know once you once you're able to see my screen. Yes, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, we can see your screen. Just make it full screen, and then we can go ahead. Okay. All good now. Um. Not yet, but just go ahead. Um, since we are a little bit tight on the time, it's not really good. The slide. Okay, I am going to uh, remove um, the video. Um, my internet is not uh, is not very uh, stable, so I hope that is okay with you guys. So um, I want to briefly take you through our partnership with Ambassad and- um, uh, Dennis, let me interrupt you. Yes. Um, you see yeah. that, that um, um, on the left, you could reduce that panel so that maybe the slides will be clear. Uh, on the left. Or just put you, uh, okay. Um, okay, just go on, just go on. Uh, you can see my, the, my, the, my presentation, I hope. We can see, um, maybe in the menu, go to slideshow. Go to slideshow and- uh, I, I'm already on slideshow, actually. Okay. Just then just go ahead, just go ahead then. Or, uh, or you can display uh, if yes. mine has an issue, I think. Uh, is that okay? I proceed? Yeah, just go ahead, just proceed. Um, so I was saying um, 
Um, my, I am going to take you through our partnership with our persons and uh, uh, it's actually a very brief uh, presentation. Um, uh, the first part will be about uh, the history of um, this partnership, how it came up to be. Then um, uh, the second uh, part, which is also very brief, will be about uh, the safety requirements of uh, having uh, uh, an EV, EV charging uh, solution or EV charging uh, infrastructure in a, in a, in a fuel station. Uh, this is uh, not uh, specifically for two wheelers, but generally for uh, vehicles. How can uh, uh, how can uh, uh, an EV uh, solution um, or product uh, coexist with uh, the other existing uh, amenities or facilities in a uh, in a gas uh, station? And then, lastly, obviously, uh, after having gone through the safety requirements, we then. Uh, uh, just to briefly see how that was translated uh, here locally when uh, we launched uh, or rather constructed uh, the ambassade uh, charging stations, uh, battery swapping stations in our network here in, uh, in Kenya. Um, so um, just a minute. Yeah, so... Um, yeah. Um, let me let me just share my the presentation and then you can just write through it. Okay. All right. Uh, fantastic. So I'll wait for you to share. Yeah. Done now. Okay. Ah, good. All right. Thank you. So uh, now go for uh, the, this is page uh, page three. Go back to page two. No. Yes, uh, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, there, yeah, stop. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think uh, most of people in the EV, uh, in the EV sector, especially the two-wheeler market, uh, know Ampersand quite well. Uh, I know, in, especially in Nairobi, uh, Ampersand has uh, several competitors, but uh, just briefly, Ampersand uh, is a startup that was, was uh, created um, in 2014 in Rwanda. And uh, in between, there was a lot of work that went into research about uh, uh, their, their, their motorbike, the battery, the certification of that battery, and obviously uh, the product, or rather the company did uh, a commercial launch in uh, 2019. Uh, they first started in Rwanda and uh, the reception was quite uh, good uh, uh, and uh, driven by, uh, a good um, uh, investment uh, environment that uh, was facilitated by the government. Uh, the objective, of course, of uh, Ampersand is to develop electric mobility uh, in East Africa, uh, starting with two wheelers, um, which, as we all know, uh, are the main uh, means of uh, transport in terms of numbers compared uh, uh, to, uh, I mean, in the public transport uh, sector and uh, represent obviously a big, uh, uh, a large proportion of transport related uh, CO2 emissions uh, in the region. Uh, the business model of Ampersand is uh, battery swapping uh, uh, or renting of batteries, which are owned by Ampersand. The, uh, drivers rent the batteries and uh, come to their swap stations to exchange these batteries based on, uh, uh, based on uh, the consumption. So drivers pay, uh, pay as uh, they consume. So this model I believe uh, is uh, very much uh, present in, uh, in East Africa whereby you only pay for what you use, uh, especially for um, the last mile uh, connections in uh, various uh, models. Uh, to do this, uh, Ampersand has developed a software that um, uh, allows them to have real information on uh, the bikes, uh, real-time information, the charge of the batteries. Uh, they are able to track and monitor the batteries remotely, and uh, obviously, in case of any maintenance issues, they are able to, uh, to receive alerts. This allows, obviously, uh, Ampersand to, uh, to, opt to optimize on the use of the batteries. 
uh, the location of the, 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 the stations and uh, obviously to build uh, the driver or to make the driver pay as they go. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, you you've moved uh, from the first slide. Oh, I'm not finished. I, oh, you're still in the introduction. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not finished uh, the last uh, okay. slide. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the previous slide, yes. Okay. No, no, previous. Yeah, this one. Yeah, so um, so to, to finish on this slide, so we uh, partnered uh, uh, the, the discussion in terms of uh, our our relationship with Ampersand started, uh, I think, in 2020, 2019, whereby Ampersand um, uh, won a startup challenge organized by Moving On, where Total is uh, a partner together with Michelin and other uh, and other big uh, groups who are essentially working on uh, uh, innovative solutions for for urban mobility. And uh, as a follow up to this, in 2021, uh, we participated uh, in Ampersand's uh, Series A financing uh, through uh, through our head office. Uh, our we have a green venture fund for the total uh, energy. Uh, uh, energy ventures that uh, invest in uh, innovative uh, startups like uh, Ampersand. And uh, as a result of this uh, investment, the group introduced us to Ampersand uh, when we came uh, to Kenya to explore this market. And uh, we started uh, discussing and working with them to uh, pilot uh, uh, three stations in uh, December 2021, which uh, culminated in the launch of uh, the three stations in June uh, 2022. So obviously, uh, we can go to the next uh, slide, uh, Judith. Sorry. Um, so we uh, the, the solution uh, for one percent uh, is, uh, as I've said, is to operate a network of rapid uh, charging stations and battery swap, swaps for for e-bikes. Uh, in the market through uh, a backend uh, software that um, obviously creates a sort of a physical uh, digital energy network uh, for mobility. Uh, this uh, is in line with our uh, group ambition, which is uh, uh, to achieve uh, net zero emissions uh, by 2020. And uh, by so doing, we'll be providing uh, clean, affordable, and reliable energy for our Boda Boda uh, customers. Uh, next uh, slide. So obviously, um, our intention is, of course, to pursue further, uh, further, uh, further development to, to scale this up with Ampersand, obviously, uh, as we try and also capture the other market. So we have uh, several criteria. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, installing EV stations or EV charging infrastructure in our stations. Uh, there are of uh, uh, four types. The first one is uh, the related fire safety. We also have uh, technical requirements, uh, then the traffic safety and the market and other related requirements. So on fire safety, we are very keen on um, uh, making sure that uh, the chargers and any associated uh, equipment uh, are not uh, placed in near what we call uh, the Actex uh, zone. Uh, so for, for this, um, the equipment must respect uh, the minimum fire safety distances as per our uh, station construction and uh, maintenance manuals. We have also defined uh, safety zones depending on the, on the facility that you have at the station. So for example, uh, any highly combustible material you need that needs to be six meters like uh, LPG, for example, uh, 10 meters away from uh, any fuel equipment, dispenser of loading area, tanks, vents, and the rest, five meters and, uh, away from uh, the shop entrance. Uh, five meters to the generator. Uh, we also uh, require that uh, the power supply cables should not uh, be routed underground through the attack zones because of uh, obviously the risk of, uh, of fire. 
uh, the, 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 the above uh, conditions, of course, are not required with the, uh, the equipment that is uh, in use, either the charger, the connectors, or uh, the power boards are, uh, are certified for use in an ATEX environment. So we have uh, obviously three uh, ATEX uh, ratings, ATEX zero to two, and uh, the highest is two. So if they are, um, they are rated to, for use in such an environment, then uh, you don't require most of this. The other thing to add on this is, of course, that um, uh, these requirements uh, have been defined by the group. Uh, so they are mostly applicable in Europe, but as we roll out uh, EV charging to other uh, countries, we have, we have to adapt to the local regulations that are there. Uh, so this might vary from one country to another, either higher or, or lower, depending on uh, uh, the, the, the government uh, uh, standards that have been put in place. So uh, when it comes to technical requirements, we have, um, we have to limit the distance between the power units, user interface units and the cooling uh, infrastructure of uh, the batteries or uh, 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 the batteries. Then uh, you, you also have to make sure that the charger uh, is installed in a way that there is no electromagnetic interference with uh, any other electrical IT systems on site. So in, uh, we have very many uh, installations and stations, uh, depending on the facilities that are there. We have food, uh, food facilities, we have uh, IT systems that uh, run concurrently, so we have to be very sure that the mapping is done correctly. Uh, we, of course, I also talked about um, the distances, uh, so we have to make sure that uh, charging stations, you cannot put them uh, on top of underground tanks, any underground uh, power lines or underground services, and uh, also avoid locations where uh, water can flood, like uh, the lowest station point, so the, the, the construction uh, the, the EV uh, ch charger must be placed uh, away uh, from the lowest uh, point so that uh, there's no risk of flooding. So when uh, we also have to make sure that uh, the traffic flow in the station is not obstructed. Uh, so we have to make sure that uh, when we put an EV uh, charger, um, uh, what, uh, how does the flow of the customer, the main customer flow for fuel, and even the delivery truck, which is uh, for us, it's a very high risk uh, uh, and, uh, environment and uh, event in a fuel station. So given that we always factor this when we're constructing a station, so we also have to factor this because this is an added, um, it's an added risk. Uh, obviously, uh, you can also, you, you also, we don't uh, allow uh, obstruction of uh, pedestrian movements, especially dis uh, disabled customers, and uh, access to our shops. And uh, lastly, but not the least on traffic safety is uh, easy, acce easy access uh, for parking and exit without excessive maneuvering uh, for both uh, driving or reversing uh, when uh, you are accessing uh, the EV charge. Uh, other requirements is uh, we recommend that um, uh, you cannot install a fire hydrant close to the charging system. You need also to consider uh, the operations of the, the site. Uh, this is uh, the, sta uh, the station from um, an operational point of view, maintenance and even future expansion uh, of the station. Both, uh, both for fuel services, other uh, diversification or what you call uh, SFS, uh, and uh, obviously uh, for scaling up of the AV service, we are putting it up uh, inside the station. Um, we, uh, from a marketing point perspective, we also don't want the EV charger, if it is big, to obstruct the visibility of our uh, main station uh, offers, uh, and in addition to the station offers, that is a, the you know the forecourt, but also SFS offers, which is a shop food and services. So you have we have our bonjour shops, we have our food uh, 
activities uh, with uh, third parties, but also services like uh, uh, tire, tire centers, uh, service bays, or what you call loop bays, and uh, also car washes. And uh, of course, I talked about ease of um, uh, access to, to the shop. Lastly, uh, for cost uh, reasons, you have to make sure that um, the chargers are in close proximity of uh, the power source uh, because of the type of cable that you need to use. And uh, obviously, uh, any expansion or uh, um, uh, you know boosting of the capacity of uh, the power. Uh, so in, uh, in summary, when you're assessing the EV position, we have to make sure that we provide the most convenient, uh, safe and functional service for our users in the whole ecosystem of a service uh, station. Uh, Judith, you can move on to the, the, the other slide. Uh, sorry. Um, so this is uh, just a standard uh, station layout and uh, how EV positioning uh, would look like. Um, so uh, LPG bottles, you can see we talked about uh, six meters. Um, uh, safety distances, for example, uh, depending on the number of gases or the capacity of your LPG storage, there is uh, everything is defined uh, according to our manuals. Um, uh, we, uh, um, uh, we we say the, for instance, uh, at the Focot, in, uh, in some cases, like in Europe, you are having our you are having charging stations at the Focot, but. Uh, those chargers, of course, those chargers and the equipment is uh, at accelerated, and that's why it's allowed there. But generally, it is not uh, recommended. Um, so for us, uh, when we're talking of uh, respecting specific safety distances, any electrical equipment that is below uh, 22 uh, kilowatts is uh, for us is just like a simple electrical equipment but once you go anything above 22 kilowatts then for us that is like an EV charger and we have to apply these rules uh, uh, accordingly um, so yeah next uh, slide uh, just to see what is uh, allowed and what is not uh, so as you can see uh, the, our preferred option is uh, the area uh, between the forecourt uh, the third, uh, rather the SFS on the left is what you call the uh, SFS. So you have shop services, and obviously this is the same area where you'd also have uh, a food, a food uh, operator uh, like uh, QSRs. Uh, so we recommend uh, to make sure that the delivery area, you avoid the delivery area uh, and avoid the shop enters at all cost, and obviously you cannot block uh, uh, the service base. Uh, but we have alternatives in the event of, of course, uh, we have to make sure that uh, everything is. Uh, we have an alternative in the event that the space is not available in this recommended uh, design. Uh, as you can see on the top left, uh, um, like where the. I will just request if you could put it up a little bit. Um, I yeah, so have... we can move on. I think I'm almost done. I think I only have uh, one slide. Yeah, so let's move on to the next, uh, the last one. So for ampersand, we, uh, we, this is my last slide. So for ampersand, we, we went uh, around uh, the three stations where we have uh, installed uh, the charging stations and uh, identified uh, the safety concerns uh, regarding uh, traffic uh, flow at the forecourt. And uh, we also looked at uh, the time that you need to, 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 uh, to, to do the swapping uh, and obviously providing the related signage uh, on safety. Uh, um, we also had to look at, uh, obviously, the issues that I've talked about uh, attack zoning. If uh, equipment is five meters within the distance, of the canopy edge where you have fuel, then the that equipment must be uh, rated uh, Zen 2 um, attacks. And uh, the, rest, the rest is just uh, uh, safety and access to, to the charging stations by the motorbikes. So, um, and that is um, 
uh, safety uh, bollards and uh, ramps to uh, ensure that, uh, uh, that the motorbikes do not uh, do not trip or get uh, into contact with the pedestrian fuel at the station. So that's it uh, for me, Judith. Thank you. Uh, I'll be looking at the questions and maybe answering them as you go, go on. Thank you. Bye. Uh, sorry. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, your presentation has been very inform informative. Um, it's just that the time is really tight, and I think it's because this topic is very interesting. Um, but uh, we do have some questions for you that have been put in the chat. Uh, feel free to answer them in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. I will now hand over to Amos from UNEP, who will take us into the next session. So Amos, I hand over to you. Thanks, Judith, and uh, thanks to all the presenters who've come before. I think we've had a very, uh, very an, an, an insightful session so far. And as Judith has said, the topic is very hot. So there are definitely so many answers and, and uh, answers to questions and people seeking uh, <laughs> uh, the answers to those, those questions. So uh, in a nutshell, I think we have gone through um, presentations about the AV batteries, about the battery type, about safety elements, <clears throat> about battery swapping. And we just want to shift the gears a bit and look at the, you know, like the, what, what sets this all together and that's uh, standards. So this next session is going to be about standardization and uh, the element of EVs and especially batteries. So we are joined by experts in standardization and we'll be lo looping in also Victoria, who is from the product development uh, um, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, perspective. So I'll kindly ask uh, our panelists to switch on their cameras, even as I introduce them. So we have uh, Vittorio, as I mentioned, from CRF, uh, who is coming with a background on, the, on, on, on research for world leading vehicle manufacturers. And then we also have uh, Robert Jiroge, who works for Kenya Bureau of Standards. <clears throat> he is leading the technical committee on electric mobility, which was recently, maybe not so recent, but uh, which has been formed and is working on the standards for electric mobility. We also have um, Arnold Mato from Tanzania Bureau of Standards. He's the one also who is responsible for electric mobility standards. And uh, last but not least, we also have uh, Jean Diamor uh, Mizeimana from the Rwanda Standards, Standards Board. So um, I know we are really pressed for time. Uh, yeah. So I ask that. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I ask that. Uh, uh, I ask the participants to just put in their questions in the chat box. We may not be able to address them all, and we may not be able to engage as much as we had anticipated. But uh, I can volunteer the, these experts to respond to your questions. So um, I'll just start off with Vittorio because you just came from presenting and uh, showing us a lot. And uh, just to ask uh, very shortly, if you can tell us very shortly. Um, so we, we are, we've talked about standards. And uh, some people here and there have uh, expressed that uh, at times standards limit growth of industry and innovation. What's your perspective about this? And uh, what do you think would create hurdles for research and development? Maybe yeah. Uh, you could start out from that perspective. It's a very interesting question in the sense that in general, there are two perspectives. One is that standardization can be an help, an helping element. Imagine battery swapping. If we do not standardize the shape of the battery, we are speaking of nothing. In the sense that you would have to create one station for each model brand, it has no sense maybe. On the other hand, fixing dimension volume performance, we can limit a lot the possibility to improve the technology. So particularly when the technology are in a phase in which they are ramping up as it is perceived the batteries, for instance, there are a lot of cases where the standardization is seen as something limiting these improvements. And so the not easy game is to try to find the element that can be usefully standardized, 
not damaging this chance to improve. Obviously, it's easy to say, not so equivalent, it's easy to do it, but that's some way should be the guideman. So for instance, if defining shape dimension of the battery is not limiting the chance to make the battery better in the future, that's a good way. Obviously, some technology of battery are not in favor of this because they can be more performing or not depending on spatial dimension and shape that are not covered by the standard. So it's still an open point. And keep in mind, international standardization activity take times from the day in which uh, the team uh, start to prepare the standard to when the standard uh, become something in force uh, typically pass uh, also three four years five years and sometimes in the meantime the world changes so it's not easy thanks thanks a lot Victor. i think uh, from this this session uh, i think i'm going to be quoting you on several things uh, but see it's not a fear time you need to usefully standardize your your your, your output uh, quotations. So <laughs> thanks a lot for that response. Um, I'll move on to John Um I know that uh, you're leading standardization in Rwanda. And one of the things that we've seen for Rwanda, I think it's arguably one of the most progressive or one of the countries that have very aggressive uh, fiscal and non fiscal incentives for promotion of uh, the transition to immobility. Um, so I can you can assume that there's already going to be so many startups coming up in the electric mobility space. So would you kindly give us a brief overview of where the country is as pertains to electric mobility and standardization? I have this one, have this, uh, have the standards also gotten to the same level as the uh, fiscal and non-fiscal incentives? Let's, let's hear about a bit about that. So, sorry, we, we can't hear you. Hi, hi. Yes, yes, now we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much, Amos, for that question. <laughs> um, I think, um, I'm edible uh, enough. Uh, everyone can hear me uh, clearly. Uh, as you have mentioned, uh, actually, Rwanda have put more efforts on adoption of uh, electric vehicles uh, in the country in the context, in the, for the purpose of reducing the uh, environmental uh, harm issues. Um, actually, uh, the, the, pre the previous uh, presenter uh, tackled on that. There are several actually companies uh, in Rwanda comes on uh, that are coming uh, on Rwanda market in order to address uh, that issue. There are uh, actually several companies, including Ampersand, Sav Universal, Rwanda Electric Motorcycle, Victoria Autofast, Volkswagen Mobility, and uh, MTN in Rwanda. All those companies actually are companies operating electric uh, mobility in Rwanda. So uh, there are various uh, uh, vehicles on the on Rwanda market, including motorbike, uh, right vehicles and buses and uh, trucks, electric trucks. Eh? So um, uh, those actually electric uh, vehicles can't operate uh, without standards. Standards are very key because to ensure interoperability and the compatibility of uh, vehicles to uh, charging infrastructure. So uh, the, in Rwanda, Rwanda have tried uh, through Rwanda Standards Board they have tried to develop several standards on uh, specifically on. Uh, electric batteries, uh, but also um, on the whole uh, charging infrastructure, including uh, equipments and the whole system. So uh, mainly um, uh, standards here on, on batteries here in Rwanda are mainly uh, adopted standards, IEC adopted standards, and uh, other, other standards of Rwanda origin. Uh, mainly on recycling, electric recycle, electric equipment recycling. Um, so um, when it comes to uh, to uh, adopted standards, 
they as uh, I mentioned that uh, many uh, main of standards uh, uh, developed at Rwanda in Rwanda uh, adopted standards. Uh, they are, we have several standards on safety uh, requirements of for secondary batteries and the battery installation. We have uh, standards on um, battery charger, battery charge controllers. We have uh, batteries on uh, uh, on uh, uh, on user user application and portable applications, we have uh, standards on uh, secondary lithium cells for the provision of electric road road vehicles, uh, including uh, in terms of reliability and abuse testing. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, there are other standards developed as it were as uh, standards of Rwanda origin. They are uh, especially on um, waste handling. Eh? We have the standard on electric and electronics waste uh, handling, collection, transportation, and storage. It is a requirement standard. It has part one and part two. And uh, uh, there are standards which are under development or adoption uh, on electric vehicle battery swamp systems. Uh, that those are uh, adopted IEC standards, and uh, we have. Um, if you, if you uh, we have to interject another um, standard under development on marking John? symbols identification of who. John Jamor. Yes, Amos. If you allow me to, to interject, I know that there are quite a number of standards that we. Yeah, we, we have, have many have standards. Mobility, mm -hmm. but uh, my. Uh, I, would, I would like to check just with you how many of these standards have been adopted by Rwanda. And because uh, I know there is a whole spectrum of uh, standards, but how many of these have been adopted aside from the ones that you said are for environment, um, the environmental end of use or recycling? Uh, actually, um, on uh, uh, the end, uh, on the recycling part, well, we, we don't have uh, adopted the international standard, but we, we have developed ours, uh, including e-waste handling. Those are including uh, e-waste handling, as uh, I mentioned it. It is on e-waste handling, transportation, storage, ETC. They are two, it is one standard which have uh, two parts. Okay. Thanks for that response. I'll allow me to just uh, interject at this point because we are really pressed for time. And let us hear from Arnold uh, Mato from the Tanzania Bureau of Standards. Just give us a glimpse of how standardization is in uh, in Tanzania. Because uh, I remember back in 2018, I could see so many electric scooters uh, in the streets of Dar es Salaam. So would you just let us know how it is in uh, Tanzania? What have you been able to do? And maybe. You can take it from there. Just to note that also Tanzania is one of the, Dar es Salaam actually is one of the cities where we are doing uh, the EC Solutions Plus uh, pilot. But uh, Arnold Mato, please come on board and tell us. Arnold, can you hear us? Okay, as Arnold tries to figure this out, I'll go to Robert. Joroge, we happen to be based uh, or breathing the same country air yeah? because he's in Kenya and I'm in Kenya as well. But uh, one of the things that we've noticed for Kenya is that we set a, a, a target to introduce electric mobility, having a 5% target for electric vehicles by 2025. Currently, we are at less than 1%, but uh, I think arguably, this is the hub for all startups. So uh, would you just give us an update, uh, give us a brief overview of how it is in Kenya, what you've done in terms of standardization, and then we'll take it from there. Over to you. Thank you, Amos. Uh, I, I don't know whether, am I audible? Yes, very well. Yeah, uh, so in terms of uh, Kenya, the whole value chain for immobility, 
I think for us, uh, we are facing a kind of uh, unique situation where we are having um, immobility units across all the, the sectors. That is, we have uh, companies doing electric two and three wheelers. We have companies doing um, light duty vehicles as well as heavy duty vehicles. So for us, I think uh, in matter standardization, it's, it's uh, more of uh, some sort of firefighting. That is, we're having all sectors with players coming in and setting up uh, uh, companies. Also, in terms of charging infrastructure, we have companies already which have set up. So also in that angle, that is uh, some sort of firefighting in terms of uh, standardization, trying to catch up with what the industry is doing. But uh, that also doesn't mean that we haven't also uh, done our level best. Uh, so for us, uh, I, can, I believe in 2018 is when we did our first standards for immobility. We did uh, 24 standards, which all captured uh, the electric vehicle itself. But the charging infrastructure, that is a gap that I hope before the end of the year or beginning by uh, in 2023, we are going to tackle that aspect. So in terms of uh, EVs, and when I say EVs, also I mean uh, electric two and three wheelers, we did standards for uh, the battery electric vehicles, uh, hybrid vehicles, uh, two and three wheelers, that is mopeds and motorcycles. And all those standards, the main aspect that we were trying to capture is the safety specifications. So in all those standards, one thing they have in common is that they have uh, safety specifications. Then uh, another um, issue that also we tried to standardize was testing. The only, the only disadvantage of, of, of uh, uh, those testing standards is that uh, right now, as we speak, we don't have capacity to perform some of these tests. But uh, in matters uh, trying to kind of safeguard the Kenyan user in terms of immobility, we are trying to uh, ensure the safety aspect. Yes. Thanks a lot, Robert. And uh, just to check again if Arnold Mato is available. If you're available, please uh, switch on your mic. But as uh, as he comes on, I think it is important that uh, we progress with this conversation on standardization, because as you said, uh, Robert, and I think uh, John Diango already talked about this, safety is a big thing. And uh, maybe I don't know if I was, I'll, I'll bring you back, uh, John, to just tell us um, what's the plan for Rwanda in terms of standardization and uh, you know just uh, creating or establishing the, the environment right because we need to, to be protected as even as we are um, aboard or embrace this new technology would you just tell us what's the plan for Rwanda in terms of standardization and whether you are linking it to the regional um, regional level the east africa regional level Sorry, again, I think you're very faint. We can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Amos, for that question. Actually, as I uh, mentioned, that uh, Rwanda is putting more efforts on adoption of uh, electric mobility and uh, to ensure the uh, compatibility and interoperability, the standards is. Uh, is a key uh, uh, to, to, to handle that. Eh? Uh, actually, um, as I mentioned, uh, Rwanda was trying, uh, Rwanda Standards Board was trying, tried its uh, best to standardize this sector, uh, not only on battery, but also the whole uh, uh, value chain or uh, infrastructure. Uh, in the Actually, Rwanda Standards Board in a partnership with the Rwanda Utility uh, Regulatory Authority has uh, set, uh, had set uh, a roadmap on developing uh, standards uh, on equipments, uh, on um, uh, user interface, on the layout of charging station, because uh, uh, as, uh, um, uh, uh, as far as possible, the charging station have to be in place and of course have to be standardized. So uh, uh, Rwanda Standards Board in partnership with the uh, RURA, Rwanda Utility Regulatory Authority, 
uh, have set uh, a roadmap on the development of those all um, standards in, in that value chain in order to be able to develop the to come up with technical regulations because uh, the, 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 the whole value chain have to have uh, uh, technical regulation is governing the, the, the each and every uh, uh, part of the system. So uh, we've uh, set a roadmap of around, uh, we are going to develop and adopt around uh, 24 standards on that value chain in order to uh, be able um, to operate uh, safely. So uh, mainly the standards are uh, the, the, the intended, uh, the planned uh, standards to be developed uh, specifically on safety of the uh, equipment and the charging infrastructure and uh, the performance uh, when we are during the development of that roadmap, uh, we identified the performance of the charging infrastructure. And of course, uh, we looked at uh, the end uh, uh, life of uh, equipment and infrastructure. So those are uh, um, a sector, and of course, specification have to be in place, specification standards and test methods have to be in place. So, um, during the uh, development of the roadmap, all those uh, criteria uh, was observed and take, uh, taken care of. And I think um, if uh, there is another uh, uh, criteria which, are, which will be identified in the future, will it be uh, catered for. So, uh, but so far we considered uh, safety, performance requires requirements, performance criteria, uh, specification, and the end life of the equipment. Thank you, Amos, thank about you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So safety, performance, and end of life of the batteries. Thank you very much for that as a, just uh, telling us that, that is the direction we need to take. So um, I'm going to go back to Robert. And I know that, uh, as you said, you've already adopted the standards. There's a question that was asked by Sheikh, which is what I want you to finish with about what were, I would say, what are the challenges when you are putting in place these standards? And um, for me, I would also want to hear what's the plan? Where are we moving from here? I know we've already seen several vehicles coming into the country and in, in no time, then yeah, they are, you know, they are grounded. It's been pro uh, projected that it will be because of the batteries. So what 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 are we doing? What what's the what's the Kenya Bureau of Standards plan to do about this? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Amos. Actually, I've just seen the question from Sheikh. Ah, uh, so let me start with that. Uh, uh, who championed the e-mobility policy formation? So I'll assume that you mean the the TC. I'll assume that because that is what I was talking about. Um, that was championed from uh, the industry. So basically, um, for us, once we identify a gap, so we identify we identified a gap from the industry. So that is what actually initiated the formation of the uh, electric mobility TC. Uh, for Amos. Uh, in terms of uh, what you're asking about what we're doing and the cars or, or, or rather the EVs which have been grounded. So right now what you're looking at is to come up with a standard for uh, testing of used EVs. So I'll note that uh, that is a conversation that I can comfortably say I have not had it in any of the immobility um, forums that I've, I've, I've been part of. What we keep talking about is the is new EVs, but what happens to us as a developing country, which actually imports most of our, of our, of our used vehicles, that is uh, majority from Japan and, and other, and other um, uh, developed countries. So that is an area where we need to move with speed. It's only that, uh, the industry itself, that is all the vehicle manufacturing companies are not looking in that angle. So it's, it's up to us to actually um, develop our own specifications, 
but uh, obviously at the end of the day that is something that uh, needs uh, some financial assistance because it, it entails setting up of testing facilities, uh, uh, conducting research, so it's, it's a gap that is, um, is, is what it's not so easy to solve. But what uh, currently I have uh, identified is that there's some talk in that line at the UN level, the UNECE, they have a committee uh, which they are kind of tackling that issue. But at the end of the day, um, you can uh, bear me witness that it might, the, what the progress at which that conversation is going or that document is going to be uh, developed might not be as fast as our countries adopting the immobility um, uh, what, uh, vehicles. So, so to speak, we should actually develop our uh, standards. And now, because now in this uh, uh, panel discussion, we have uh, two of my colleagues in other standardization bodies. I think that is an area where we can come together as the East African Committee form uh, a regional committee on immobility and take that up as the first project, then we'll have uh, a harmonized standard at the East African level, which uh, tackles the testing of used EVs. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Robert. And um, I think that's a very good way to wrap up. I know we've been really pressed for time. We didn't get to really get in depth uh, to the issues, especially of, of batteries. But I really want to appreciate the time that we've, you've made, uh, Robert, uh, Vittorio, uh, John Jamor, and Arnold, who I, seems like has had a challenge in unmuting. Really appreciate that you made time to be part of this. And uh, I think we'll continue to engage. And as you said, Robert, the clarion call for the other standardization bodies across the region is to come together and standardize because we rely on uh, used uh, input. So I'll stop it at that because I know we've overshot by more than 10 minutes. So I'll take it back to Judith and thanks a lot for your participation. Thank you to you. Bye. Uh, thank you very much, Amos, for leading us in that very interesting session. Um, and there was also a lot of participation from the uh, participants on the chat. Um, I do understand that we have really been pressed for time um, today, but I do believe that this is the beginning of discussions. I like the way the previous session concluded in how the different standardization bodies in East Africa can come together and work together on harmonized standards. So that's something that we can continue working on and we hope that the discussions will go forward. Um, I just want to share with you the program for tomorrow. Um, once again, we'll be having a presentation on battery management software from Idiada. We'll have a presentation from Mobile Power on their solution for battery options. We'll have a presentation from Stima Mobility on battery and fleet management. We'll have a pre presentation focusing on financing uh, from E3 Capital and one focusing on digitalization of fleets um, in the context of mobility as a service from Plus Service. And then we will conclude with a very interesting panel uh, where we we'll talk with three startups um, from different parts in Africa, Solar Taxi, MFA, and Ecoboda, just discussing how they are approaching the aspects of battery asset management. So this is what we will do tomorrow. I also just want to remind everybody that on 1st to 2nd November, we will also have a similar two-hour workshop on end-of-life management of batteries. So, um, just to keep that in mind in your calendars. I will just say that we'll also just make sure to send you a reminder on email. Um, yes. So with that, I want to thank you all for staying this long, even as we have gone over time. I want to thank all our speakers uh, for attending these sessions. Apologies that we have really limited your time and I'm sure that you had so much more to share, which we would have really appreciated to hear, but due to the limitation of time, we couldn't, we had to limit everybody's time. And thank you also to the participants for giving us your time and for listening. And we hope that um, this workshop will continue spark on, sparring conversations um, and even implementation and we can work together. Uh, thank you all very much, and I hope to see you tomorrow at the same time for this session. 
thank you and have a good evening and a good day, depending on your location. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Bye.